You can turn to Matthew 28 this morning for our last study in the book of Matthew. I've been wanting to talk about this since we started the Gospel of Matthew. The Great Commission, the King's Commission, the last words of Jesus before He ascended into the heavens. What He spoke was not just to His disciples, His apostles, but it was to every person, as I prayed, who would call on Him and claim Him as Lord. This is the most applicable handful of verses of, I believe, any that Jesus spoke. As far as feet on the ground, hands to the work, the call placed on those who would claim the name of Jesus Christ. Several years ago, a button was developed and worn on college campuses. Perhaps you saw it. It had four block letters written on the face of the button. It just said B-A-I-K. And when people would walk up to someone wearing a B-A-I-K button, they'd ask the question, what what is B-A-I-K? What does that stand for? And, And the person would respond, boy, am I confused. You don't spell confused with a C. And then the person would say, you don't know how confused I am. (laughs) Boy, am I confused. Few topics of doctrinal discussion and debate are more confused than the mission of the church. We have so many different directions and ways that people go in trying to understand what is the mission of the church. Some say it's clearly cross-cultural overseas ministry. It is missions. Others would say, hey, no, no, no. The mission of the church is all about worship, man. We need to be a worshiping church. That's the thing. Others are looking for spiritual experience or a new movement. Most people are just looking how to get from one week to the next. What is the mission of the church? I've lost count of a number of books, and they're always coming out, and there's always a new one. Touting everything from church growth strategies... Developing your church's vision for the 21st century, the purpose-driven church, how to become an emerging missional church, the reformational church, with all these different books. In fact, I don't even like reading these books anymore. I just get confused, because that's not what the last guy said we're supposed to do, so i got to do this now? I spent years, gang, in ministry, going from one strategy to the next, thinking the new one, this is the one that's going to do it. And all the while, Jesus gave us the strategy. He gave us the mission, and it doesn't need to be confusing. Meanwhile, while we struggle in the church to figure out what this mission is, if the unchurched, unreached, unbelieving population of the United States alone ever formed their own country, it would make up the world's 11th most populous nation. Boy, am I confused. Well, praise God, 1 Corinthians 14.33 tells us, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. There does not have to be confusion about our mission, our purpose, our vision. The Lord clearly defined it for us. From the very beginning, as a matter of fact, God's vision, His mission for mankind, was obvious. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Psalm 86 verse 9 says, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. Isaiah 43 verse 21, The people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. In Revelation 4.11, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. And in all this we understand, we get a sense of God's mission, His design from the beginning. He made man and woman in His image and charged us to be fruitful and multiply and fill all the earth, acknowledging His glory. Acknowledging His honor. Acknowledging His power. You want to know what made me the most sick this last week about Earth Day? Is there is no acknowledgement of God as creator of the earth. How about Creator Day? I have no problem with taking care of the earth as good stewards. Of what God has given us. We should be good stewards. We shouldn't be about trashing the planet. And yet, it's not about the planet. It's about the creator of This planet and bringing all glory and honor and power to Him. 
But praise the Lord, we don't have to search the whole scriptures. We don't have to go from one verse to another to try to sum up a mission and figure it out. Jesus made it absolutely simple. Before ascending, he summed it all up. Matthew chapter 28, in verse 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let me share with you a few things that are not mentioned by Jesus in the King's Commission. Institutionalism is not mentioned. That is, the spreading and developing of denominational cookie-cutter churches and their own brand name or logo. We are not to be about being an institution. The Bridge Fellowship, the Bridge South, the Bridge North, the Bridge West. That's not the point. He doesn't mention institutionalism. He doesn't mention imperialism. That is, the, the building of glorious and grandiose structures to loom impressively and imposingly over area codes. Experientialism. Offering exciting and constantly changing experiences to soothe the savage church member. That's not mentioned in the King's Commission. Political activism. That is defining a church by our political stances and our public rallies. Now, yeah, I sent out an email this week that you could take as political. Talking about H.R. 1913, which was brought up in the, in the House Judiciary Committee... It is to more clearly define the uh, the local what is it the local law uh, the local hate crimes law and the wording in this law is incredibly dangerous because it begins to tap into or take away from free speech such that if a pastor from the pulpit were to even read Romans one passages in Leviticus passages in other places of the Scripture they would be could be called on hate crimes for simply disparaging homosexuality as the scripture does. For simply using a word like depraved in the same sentence as homosexuality, which the Lord did. Now, let me be clear. It is not the mission of the Bridge Christian Fellowship to be political. I am not concerned. I, 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 you may have seen this email I sent out yesterday, but I, was, I got an email response to the first email earlier in the week just saying... What, you know, what's the standard there between being a political pastor? How political should, should you be as a pastor? And I, I sat back and, and I thought, wow. Because the email I, it didn't, didn't question me. It was just asking a very honest and good question. You know, I've noticed that you're pretty politically active. And I went, really? I didn't think I was. I mean, you know, I, mean I know I tell some jokes. <laughs> and I obviously have my own political convictions. But that's not the point of our meeting. And if you think it is, and if you think that this church has to be bound to or tied to one political party or another, you're completely wrong. That's not why we're here. Jesus said nothing about that in the King's Commission. His mission is far grander, far more life-altering than how you vote. I just think how you vote should be impacted by your faith. So he doesn't preach or teach institutionalism or imperialism or experientialism or political activism and he doesn't also note this one he doesn't talk about relevant culturalism figuring out how to squeeze some kind of postmodern relevance out of the Bible like juice from an orange we got to recast scripture so that it meets culture so that people in this culture can understand it better don't you think God thought that through before spilling one word onto the page don't you think he knows how to make relevant his word to mankind? And all these things can get so confusing with a K. But consider the commission that Jesus set before us. Let's go back one more time. We go back to the Galilee, which I think is interesting. Jesus said, meet me there in the Galilee, and, and he met them there. Let's unify our hearts and minds with the great commission of Jesus Christ above and beyond all other ideas that, that I may have, you may have, or we may have about what the church's mission is supposed to be. Go back to verse 16, Mark, uh, Matthew 28. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. 
I talked about this Wednesday night. Jesus had them go back to the Galilee. I love that. There's something precious about that. He doesn't say, meet me on the Temple Mount, though the veil was rent. He doesn't say, meet me in the upper room or on the Mount of Olives or near the garden, near the tomb. He goes, let's go back. Meet me back where the mission began. Meet me back where ministry started. Let's go back to the Galilee. I will meet you there. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. We're told that Jesus, when he heard that John had been taken into custody, withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we're told in verse 18, Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their, the, the boat and their father, and they followed him. Back to the place of original calling. This is where Jesus wants to meet with the apostles. Remember where it all started, boys? Let's go back there and think about what really happened. Because I'm convinced the apostles had missed it. Jesus had given very clear parameters to the mission that they were supposed to be on. But after the death and the burial and even the resurrection, they were kind of confused. A little unsure. And so Jesus took them back to the place of the vision. God's going to do that from time to time with you. He's done it with me. He will take you back to the place of your original calling. You see, we can get real wrapped around the axle about what we're involved in or engaged in right now. My new mission, my new church, my new ministry. And so I'm doing this stuff. And we start to veer off the path of where God originally called us. And so he'll say, Rick, why don't you come back to the Galilee? Do you remember how it all began? Do you remember the first time we sat and talked about these things? Go back to the Galilee. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 says, As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Having been firmly rooted, and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. And I'm convinced the Lord would have us return to the place of our calling from time to time, if for no other reason to remember our excitement over what was happening in our lives. To see the change in us that, that God wrought. How he pulled us out of darkness and into light. And in that moment, you remember when you gave your life to Jesus, you were pumped. Yes, this is what it's all about. And then life starts to happen. And then ministry starts to happen. And our focus begins to get muddy and confusing. And I think the Lord would say, go back to the Galilee. Go back to the place of your calling. Not not the physical location necessarily, but the place of your heart. Go back there. Meet Jesus there. Worship Him there. They did that. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some were doubtful. What did Jesus do with the doubtful? Hammer them? Get on their case? Come on, you guys. What do you think this was all about? Did He guilt trip them? I can't even believe after what I just went through last weekend that you guys are doubting me now. I mean, if that's the way this is going to be. What did Jesus do? Point out their spiritual immaturity or their need to get with the program? (laughs) Acts chapter 1 verse 3 says, To these apostles he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Jesus is a real PK. He is a real patient king. And he works with us and deals with us where we are at. By the way, when you find yourself getting impatient with someone else in the church who may not be as spiritual as you are, I know it's hard to imagine, but when you come across someone who's just not clicking the way you're clicking or the way you believe they should be, and you're watching them behave in such a way or act in such a way or do certain things, and you're thinking, 
They really need to grow up. When you find that person in your life, I recommend you read Romans chapter 15. Let me read this to you. Paul said, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his own good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. Let me read that again. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus wasn't just patient enough to take our sins on the cross, the sins of even the apostles on the cross, but after the cross, he spent 40 days patiently bearing with them, still willing to deal with them in their weakness, in their doubting, in their lack of strength. Paul says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. You know, when you go back to the Galilee, you might also remember how God accepted you, where you were, where your, where your maturity was as a spiritual being. Remember that. Jesus is patient with us. And He took the time that was necessary to draw the apostles along, to show them again and again who He was, to replant the concept of the kingdom. And He did it in the rich soil of their original calling in the Galilee. Well, at the end of that time, 40 days, at the end of the extra six weeks that Jesus spent replanting the apostles just before he ascended, he lays out the greatest calling ever given to man, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I don't know if Jesus said it that way. All authority. You know, I, I imagine Jesus probably just said, Guys, the authority is mine. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. This is the Galilee of our mission, the authority of Jesus Christ. This is the place to which, more than any other, we must return. When you gave your life to Christ, if you gave your life to Christ, you did so by accepting Him as Lord, as the authority over your life. Let me give you a couple of things. If you want to jot these down, you can. You don't have to. But Jesus begins the Great Commission with the assurance of His authority. Before telling them what to do, He tells them again who He is. Where the power comes from. Where the legitimacy of this ministry originates. And it's with the authority of Jesus Christ. And I point that out because if we come from human effort, we will fail. If we focus in the area of our own human strength, we will find frailty, frustration, It'll fall apart. It's not going to work. But if we begin with Jesus, the outcome will be His, and it will be great. Mark Driscoll, in his book, The Radical Reformation, wrote this. Jesus. Now, this is chapter 1 of the book, first word of the book. Jesus. The first word of this book must be Jesus, because everything begins and ends with Him. But the longer someone is a Christian, the greater their propensity to diminish the Jesus of the Bible until he becomes a predictable little God who ceases to surprise them. It is imperative that all Christians continually search the Scriptures in order to see Jesus clearly. His authority. It is His work that is being done, not mine and not yours. And not someone else's idea of what it's supposed to look like. It is the authority of Jesus Christ. The Roman centurion understood that, didn't he? Remember the story? He comes up to Jesus, sought him out in order to have his servant healed. And he knew he had faith that Jesus could do it. And he comes to him and he says, Lord, I want you to heal my servant. Matthew chapter 8, verse 9, Jesus said to him, or verse 7, sorry. He said, I will come and heal him. Okay, show me. What, what, which way to your house? The centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word. Say the word and my servant will be healed. Now, I love this. Listen to this man. For I also am a man under authority. With soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. And Jesus, when he heard this, he marveled 
And he said to those who were following truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. What's so faithful about this centurion? He understood the chain of command. This military officer understood how authority worked. And he knew Jesus had the authority to heal. He said, I'm under authority too. I understand this. And I know you've got the power. You don't have to come to my house. Just say the word. And it'll be done. Because I know you have the authority to do so. What a great thought. You're dealing with someone in your life. You would love for them to come to know Jesus. You know what you ought to be praying? Lord Jesus, say the word. Say the word. I don't even have to go to their house. I know. Say the word that they might be healed. Say the word that they might hear you. Say the word, Lord. Jesus begins the Great Commission by assuring His apostles that He has all and absolute authority. And I'm pretty sure they needed to hear it. And so do I. It's just like Him. He gets their doubts. He understands their qualms, their uncertainties, their inferiorities. He gets all of it. So before again telling them what to do, He assures them of the power to do this. Now you might ask the question, well, wait a minute though, what does Jesus mean all authority has been given to me? Pastor Rick, you've said that Jesus is God. Is He God or is He not? And if He's God, He would have the authority. So why would He say all authority has been given to me? This is a mind-blowing truth. It means that Jesus earned it. He earned the authority. He earned the right. Stay with me here. Innately, we know He had it before He ever set foot on the earth. Being God, He had all authority. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 says, By Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He, that is Jesus, is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. That sounds like authority to me. And that preceded His coming to the earth. But so that no one could ever say, God doesn't understand us, God doesn't get us, Jesus stripped himself of his glory and his authority. And then as Paul wrote, Philippians 2, 7, he emptied himself, taking the form of the bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. It's not because he didn't have it, gang. Jesus earned the authority back. So that when he stands before you and before me and says, hey, you're functioning under my authority, we're not like, well, yeah, but you've always had it, and of course, you don't really get us. No, we say, Jesus walked on this earth. Jesus lived in this world. He felt pain. He suffered. He had sorrows. He felt joy. He knows exactly what I'm going through. And when he says, I have the authority to tell you to go, I say, yes, you do. Absolutely, he earned it back. I am a man under authority. The assured authority of Jesus Christ. Go on to verse 19. With this authority, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This phrase, go therefore, in the Greek, and you may want to jot this down, it's the aorist passive participle. Okay? That will be important to you as you share the gospel with people, that it's the aorist passive participle. All that means is when Jesus says, go therefore, the translation is, as you go. As you're going. It's not the command form like you might have thought it was. Go! Be a missionary. It's as you're going. When you get up in the morning, as you go. When you get in the car after work, as you go. When you're heading to the grocery store, as you go. It's not on your marks, get set, go! (laughs) It's as you go. We don't explode off the starting line as, as if, you know, the firing of a gun. It's just going about our every day. And by the way, this statement, as you go, disregards a theological degree or a need for pastoral training to be a disciple of Christ. You just go. But Rick, I don't have all the scriptures down. Just go. But Rick, I'm not sure exactly. I haven't gone through a program of training in evangelism to, to make disciples. Just go. Do you love Jesus? Well, yeah. Is He your Lord and Savior? Well, yeah. Tell people about that. As you go. As you go, He says, make disciples. And this is the command form. Make disciples. 
In the Greek, it's mathetuo, make disciples. And gang, listen, it's the only verb in the Great Commission. The going, the baptizing, the teaching are all, are all participles. In other words, they are all components of the primary command. You put make disciples up here, baptizing, teaching, and going are all aspects of making disciples. The issue in the Great Commission, the King's Commission, is to make disciples. Number two in your notes, that is the centrality of his commission. We have the assurance of his authority. This is the centrality of his commission. It's what it's all about. Now, the Jews would have understood to some extent every rabbi had his disciples. Every rabbi would call apprentice students and they would walk with him and be taught by him and spend time with him. And they would, after a while, begin to take on some of the characteristics of their teacher. And that's the purpose. You and I are disciples. We're disciples of Christ. The moment we give our lives to Him, we say, we're going to walk with you, Jesus. We're going to sit with you around the campfire. We're going to have dinner with you. We're going to be on journeys with you. And as we go with you, our discipleship is going to increase, and hopefully, prayerfully, we're going to take on the characteristics of our rabbi. We're going to look more and more like Jesus. John 13, verse 12, Jesus, when He had washed their feet and taken His garments and reclined at the table again, said... Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. John 13, verse 20, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When you go as a disciple of Jesus, wherever you go, as you go, You make disciples because you are like Jesus who made disciples. It was the primary reason he spent those three years with the twelve. To make disciples out of them. And you are called to the exact same thing. And this happens as the disciple remains in the presence of the teacher. One of my favorite verses in scripture, Mark 3 uh, 3, verse 13. It tells us that he went up on the mountainside and summoned those whom he himself wanted. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve so that they would be with him. And that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. But I love this. It's so that they would be with him. That he called them. The great commission, the king's commission, is about being with him and inviting others to do the same thing. It really is that simple. As you go, make disciples. Disciple making gang is not an event. It's an excursion. It's not a one time, it's not a moment in time, it's moving through time. As you go, you're making disciples. But with Jesus, please hear me on this, the stakes are very high. We can confuse the whole disciple-making process into growing our particular brand of church, institutionalization or institutionalism. We can confuse the making disciples with the idea that it's about inviting someone to walk in the door of the barn. That is not discipleship. That is not disciple making. We're not talking about membership in the Kiwanis Club or the Lions Club or some social community service organization. That is not the church. Discipleship, gang, is all about eternity. That's why the stakes are high. We don't make disciples to get people here for a yard sale. We make disciples that they might be saved for all eternity. Jesus doesn't want anybody to miss it because they were saved by some religious exercise or church membership. Or they thought by showing up that that's all it took. The process of disciple making, and and hear me on this, it requires us to roll up our sleeves in the name of Jesus and walk with people. And for far too long in the church, the idea of making a disciple or, or evangelism has been about having someone say the prayer. And once they say the prayer, you go, good, I'm going to put that one on my list. Check, I got one more person for Jesus. And then walking away while they flounder. That's not disciple making. Disciple making is seeing someone come to that point of decision of accepting Jesus and then walking with them. Staying with them in accountability, in love, in example. I mean, haven't you had that happen with you? I'll tell you what, the reason I love Jesus so much today, I can tie back to two or three youth pastors who worked with me when I was a teenager and I didn't have a youth pastor. Guys who were working in other churches who I met at camp and then through the year would call and and talk to and drive up and visit their youth group and, and talk with... And they stayed with me. They walked with me. 
And we all have friends and family around that, that have done that. That's what it means in making disciples. John said in 1 John 1, 7, If we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. Go as you go and make disciples. Let that be your first and primary mission. That is why you're here above and beyond everything else. Now, baptism and teaching are components of that. He said, go baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I commanded you. Baptism, gang, is a one-time expression of of a new disciple. A one-time expression of a new disciple. Do you know, do you remember specifically when you gave your life to Jesus? Now a lot of you do. But I'm discovering more and more a lot of people really don't, especially if you grew up kind of going to church. I'm not sure really when it happened. I just kind of always believed. I just kind of wandered into that place of believing and kept going and kept engaging. And So I'm not really sure when it happened. One of the great things about baptism, gang, is it gives you the start point. It gives you a very tangible place that you can go... I'm not really sure when I gave my life to Jesus, when I had that moment of express faith, but I remember when I was baptized. Great. That was the expression of the faith that Jesus bore in you. Mark this, though, and it's important to understand, baptism happens after a person has accepted Christ and not before. It's not something, according to Scripture, it's not something your parents do for you. It's not something that the family does for you or your church does for you. It's something you do as an expression of obedience out of the faith that you have first. Mark 16, 15. In Mark's version of the Great Commission, it tells us Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Note the order. He who has believed and has been baptized. And then he says, He who disbelieved... He who disbelieves shall be condemned. And he doesn't even mention baptism. Why? Because belief is the issue. Baptism does not save you. Baptism is the action after the belief. I believe Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And I'm going to show you that belief. I'm going to express that belief outwardly in obedience to Christ. Belief precedes baptism. And it is, it is a decision game that you, the disciple, make as an expression of your new faith. I know people in here have been baptized as babies. Now, it's actually a wrong use of the word because baptism means immersed. I know many have been sprinkled as children. And their parents made a commitment to raise them up knowing the Lord. And that's great. And that's well and good. But if that's the baptism experience you've had, that's not the baptism that Jesus is talking about. And I'm not saying that to be offensive or, or to say that your faith doesn't count because, again, it's your faith that saves you. Faith in God's grace. But baptism is the expression of the believer. And if you are now a believer and you've never made that decision yourself, you never said, I want to express myself in the waters of baptism, then why wait? Why not do it? We're warming up the pond even as we speak. (laughs) Baptism is a one-time expression of a new disciple. Teaching is the ongoing equipping to renew a disciple. Now, I I sat and really thought about these two things. Baptism and teaching. Baptism is that one-time expression. Teaching is the ongoing equipping. That's why we do this. We take roughly two hours a week as a fellowship, as part of our worship time, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and just teach. Why? Why such the emphasis on teaching? Why be so adamant about it? Can't we do other things? I've been, I've been asked, can't we do other things on Sundays and Wednesdays? And my response to that often has been, well, we have all week to do other things. Yes, you can do other things. There is nobody stopping you from doing all the multiple things that we can do as a body in Christ. Yeah, but why do you always have to be up there teaching, Rick? You just like the sound of your own voice? No. Honestly, I don't. I'm the last person who wants to hear the teachings on the internet because I've got a weird voice. (laughs) But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul writes, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Those are the five equipping gifts in the church. Five gifts. The Lord will gift men in different ways, gift women in different ways, and in these five gifts, will then, through them, equip the church. 
How do you know that? Because the next verse says he gave them for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. To the building up of the body of Christ until we all maintain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of Man to a mature man. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Why so adamant about the teaching? Because this is equipping time, gang. This is not the end all. Again, the point is not to go out and make disciples so they'll come and sit and listen to Pastor Rick talk. If that's the full extent of your faith, you're missing it. This is to equip to send out. But I'll tell you why I am so adamant about Bible teaching and why I believe it is so absolutely critical. I've read this verse to you before, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul wrote the following, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Paul's talking to Timothy. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now here it is, for the time will come when they will not endure sound Doctrine, And if there's anything in Scripture that concerns me for the state of the church, it's that verse right there. More than anything else, we are told, Paul doesn't say the time may come when they will not endure sound doctrine. He says the time will come. That one of the key signs of the end times is the church becoming less and less and less and less concerned with the truth. Which is why we live in a Judeo-Christian country at least at one time, that would now consider the law that we talked about over this last week. Because the church isn't really concerned about the truth. Because more and more in churches throughout America, they're not enduring sound doctrine. They're seeking to have their ears tickled. This is not only coming, gang. In many ways, it is here. And so I'm telling you, like it or not, in this church, we're going to be in the Word at least a couple of times a week as a fellowship. And I hope that that's not the only time you're in the Word during the week. I hope that if nothing else, that the teaching time we have together is a springboard to evangelism and to discipleship and to to you being in the Word yourself and growing in the Lord. And I hope that I say things that offend you and, and, and confuse you and stir you up. And I don't think Rick could possibly be right about that. And then you're home and you're looking through the Bible. And you're going, I'm going to prove Rick wrong. And I'm going, yes, that's exactly what I want. I believe it's exactly what God wants. Don't sit and listen to Rick, Rick's words on it. You study it. And through the process, you will get more aware of the Scripture. And you may prove me wrong. Maybe. <laughs> you know what I, I hope you know I am not arrogant enough to think that I've got the truth down but I do know that I hold the truth in my hands and I do know the spirit of the living God speaks the truth into my heart and I will stand on the truth as an absolute and not as a relative in this world baptism and teaching they're components of the big issue make disciples now watch this I love how this all ends He begins with the assurance of his authority. He expresses the centrality of his commission. And then he states the intimacy of his involvement. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Have I shared the the one about the priest who was really freaking out? He was flying in the airplane and he just didn't like flying and very nervous. And the stewardess came up to comfort him and she said, You know, uh, doesn't the Bible say something about that I will be with you always? And he says, no, it says, lo, I will be with you always. The promise, gang, the promise is, disciples, you're not going to do this alone. You are not going to go through this alone. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Guess what? People will. Jesus won't. You are going to find yourself, mark my words, you're going to find yourself at some point feeling alone in your faith, but you are not alone. I will never leave you or forsake you. The Hebrew writer says, uh, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And the greatest news about the King's Commission is this. He calls us to go, but he goes with us. And it's still all about being with Jesus. You're not sent off without Him. 
Man, from our peaceful Galilees to our intense Jerusalems, from our temptations in the wilderness to our trials before the enemy, Jesus has been there and Jesus will be there with you. Always. He says to the very end of the age. Well, when exactly is that? Well, it's at least seven years after you and I go home. Because the end of the age, gang, marks the beginning of the next age, which is the millennial kingdom, where Jesus comes back and establishes His rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth, fulfilling all of His promises to Israel and His guarantees in Scripture. This age ends as that one begins. And according to Scripture, the church has been caught up before that happens. Before the tribulation of seven years. But until the time when He calls us up, and even beyond that, Jesus has promised to be with us. To the very end, He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He says in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I didn't understand... Uh, what Russ and Kathy went through as they waited to adopt Moses. I didn't get it. I knew that there were, there were you know, passport problems. I knew that they had been told by Ghanaian officials, you will never take this child out of this country. And I prayed for them, and I heard for Russ and Kathy as friends of mine, but I did not understand how it felt <laughs> until the time started to wear on with us. Until weeks turned into months. And I remember the first time I thought about Jesus saying, I will never leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And in my life, I have never felt that more passionately, more powerfully than I have in these last months. We would send letters off to Naomi and Anna Marie and David, though, you know, he can't read. But we would send letters to them And as we sent those letters, our hearts were just, we are coming. We are coming to get you. We will not leave you. You are our kids now, and we will be there for you. And that's what Jesus said to you and to me. He said, after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. When is that day? Gang, better question is, when was that day? When was the day? Jesus said, after a little while, I will come to you. Guess what? He's not talking about His second coming there. He is talking about that day, He said in Acts 1.8, when you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to all the remotest parts of the earth. He said to the apostles, I'm going to be gone for just a short time. How long was that? Ten days. There were ten days between when He ascended and when His Spirit was poured out on the apostles. I'm going to be gone a little while, but then I'm going to come, and you're going to see me, guys. And you're going to see me. Believers in Christ, when we say that we go with Jesus, that we walk with Him as we go to make disciples, we see Him. We see Him. He is with us. We talk to Him. I remember I watched an interview with, uh, with Amy Grant a little while ago talking about when she finally realized the reality of Jesus. And she said she was in a Bible study and sitting there, and all of a sudden this kid started praying, and she opened her eyes and looked around because it sounded like God had walked into the room. The way this kid was praying, she said, was like all of a sudden, I mean, he was talking as if God was right there. I had never heard anybody pray like that before. Which is why when we talk to Jesus, we don't go, Oh, thou who art so far from me, thine will be done in my life. No. We say, Jesus, I'm having a hard day today. Lord, can you show me how to handle this? Father, I need some of your wisdom because I'm not sure what to do with this. And I know you have... No, it is so personal and so intimate. And, And I... I think a lot of us miss that. We're called to make disciples. And you think, oh, that's overwhelming. It's a big task. I'm just going to go to work. No. You need to understand. You're called to make disciples, but He's right there. You don't, know how, you don't have to know how to do it. You just have to know He's there. And He's going to show you. He's going to show me how to do it. 
And ten days after Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Ten days later, boom, he came to them in, big, in a big way in Acts chapter 2. As the Spirit of Christ fell upon the apostles like a rushing wind. And he has been with us ever since and will be with us to the very end of the age. And that's his promise. Now everybody listen here for a second. If your Bibles are open, you can close them and just give me a second longer. Do you realize what Jesus just did with the King's Commission? He took He took the grand offer of eternal hope in His gospel truth and He handed it to you. And He gave it to me. Here it is. This is the deal. Eternal salvation is the whole issue of all the ages. Here it is right here. And He handed it to us. And you got to know there were angels watching this thing going, Huh. You're leaving it with them? Are you sure about this, Lord? Twelve guys? Eleven? One already blew it. You got eleven and they're not looking good. And you handed the Great Commission to them. He didn't give the Great Commission to an institution. He didn't offer the Great Commission to a political party. Thank goodness. He didn't give it to a company. He did not offer it to a government. He took the eternal hope of the gospel of truth and handed it to you. Here you go. As you go, make disciples. As you go, make disciples. The goal of the Great Commission is global. But the process of the Great Commission is personal. Don't be overwhelmed. Your commission, listen, your commission is not to save the world. And guess what? You can't do it. But you can save one person. You can save just one. By the power of the Spirit of Christ in you, you can be the tool, the instrument that God uses to save one person. And and when that's happened, and they're strong in the Lord, go save one more. And when that's happened and they are strong in the Lord, go save one more. That's the Great Commission. It's about one person at a time. We start our Christian walk by accepting His authority. Jesus is Lord of my life. And that's great. All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. And in that walk, we long for His intimacy. And well, we should. He says, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. But if we are truly disciples of Christ... If we are truly men and women under His authority, walking in His intimacy, then we must embrace the centrality of the Great Commission to go and make disciples. It is not my call as a pastor. It's my call as a Christian, as a son, as a child of God. I don't do this because I'm paid to or hired to do it. It is your call and not somebody else's. It's not the missionary's call. If it were the missionary's call or the pastor's call, it would be called the great abdication. (laughs) Let someone else do it. Jesus is not saying, if you're up for it, if you feel like it, if you think you're equipped for it, go make disciples. No, that would be the great suggestion. This is the King's commission to every single one of His followers. And you are not exempt if you have given your life to Jesus Christ. You are to go and make disciples. That's your call. And Father, we come before You this morning to accept and embrace the call that You have placed on our lives. We receive our salvation, Lord, by faith in Your grace. We trust You. We know we're going to be saved because, Jesus, you died for us. And you took our punishment, our sin on yourself. Praise you for that. Thank you, Lord. But this morning, we accept the call to make disciples. Today, Lord, more than any other, we offer ourselves to you and say, Use us, Lord, one person at a time, to be disciple-makers. Lord, impress 
the King's commission, your commission, Jesus, into our hearts today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up together.